Hey, welcome everyone to this CDOC webinar today. I'm pleased to introduce Amy Hickson of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Earth Science at Notre Dame. Amy uh, is also the director of the uh, Actinide Center of Excellence, as you can see, one of our sister NNSA Stewardship Science Academic Alliance centers. And she'll be telling us about uh, work in that center today. It's actually quite appropriate for Amy to give this talk today because on April 20th, 1902, exactly 120 years ago, Marie and Pierre Curie successfully isolated radium salts from uraninite or the mineral pitch blend as it was called then. And this helped of course launch the field of actinide chemistry and physics that uh, Amy will tell us about. Amy is an analytical chemist with, with a bachelor's from Radford University and a master's and PhD from Clemson, which she received in 2008 and 2013, respectively. And as a uh, doctoral student, she also worked at the Nuclear Regulatory uh, Commission. So we look forward to your talk, Amy, and an update on your center activities. Uh, thank you so much, Russell, for that introduction and for the great historical tip that you shared with everyone. It's very exciting to, as you said, be talking to everybody about actinide science um, at, at this important uh, anniversary. Uh, so today I'm going to give you guys sort of a very brief overview of some of the recent research that we've been doing in the Actinide Center of Excellence. Um, as Russ mentioned, this is a sister center to CDAC um, and we're funded. Uh, through the NNSA uh, SSAA program. Uh, ACE was founded in October 2017, and I took over as director at the beginning of 2021. Uh, so a little bit about the mission and what research uh, we try to focus on in ACE. Uh, the mission of ACE is to conduct research in actinide chemistry and materials with integration of experimental and computational approaches and an emphasis on research questions and priorities that are important for the security of the nation via stockpile stewardship with wor workforce development a motivating goal. So you can see on the right hand of my slide here, um, a little uh, clover leaf trying to mimic uh, Notre Dame and, and the luck of the Irish. Uh, we have three main research themes. Uh, the first research theme uh, focuses on actinide oxide clusters where we're really looking at uh, the structures of these materials and their properties. The second research theme um, is on the thermal chemistry of these actinide materials that we're able to synthesize and characterize. And the third research theme focuses on environmental and process chemistry of um, plutonium and other actinides. Sort of at the center of ACE um, are all of the people, our graduate students, undergraduate students, postdocs, um, senior investigators, et cetera. Um, and that's what I'd like to start off with uh, talking about first. Uh, so ACE has uh, seven senior investigators across uh, five different academic institutions. Um, as Russ already mentioned, I'm an associate professor here at the University of Notre Dame, and my expertise is in plutonium chemistry and geochemistry. Um, Omar Farha is um, a professor at Northwestern University, and he is an expert in metal organic framework synthesis and characterization. Laura Gagliardi is a professor at the University of Chicago, and she is a computational chemist uh, who has uh, an expert uh, with actinide materials. Neil Ivory is an emeritus professor at Washington State University and is in the Department of Chemical Engineering. Uh, so a lot of his research focuses on um, electrochemical uh, separations of actinide and fission products and things like that. Jay Laverne uh, is a research uh, scientist here at the University of Notre Dame and his expertise is um, radiation effects on actinide and other materials. Leanne Moreau is an assistant professor at Washington State University and her expertise is at the intersection of actinide materials, nanomaterials um, and uh, synchrotron X-ray characterization. And last but not least, uh, May Nyman is a professor at Oregon State University and her expertise is in uh, polyoxometallate chemistry. Uh, the Actinide Center of Excellence currently supports somewhere around 15 students. Uh, the number changes slightly from academic uh, year to academic year. Uh, so most of them are shown here on this slide. 
Uh, we're proud that approximately 70% of the graduate students in ACE identify as female and somewhere around 30% of them identify as a member of an underrepresented group. We also have a number of postdoctoral scholars, uh, both here at Notre Dame, at Oregon State, and at the University of Chicago. Um, and they help us uh, run our program smoothly and help uh, with the further development of the graduate students in addition to um, embarking on their own research opportunities. Further pipeline development includes um, involving undergraduates in research. Uh, so I have three good examples here, though I'm sure there are more undergraduates and even high school students that are involved in research in some of our labs. Um, so Trevor Arena was an undergraduate uh, with May, working with May Nyman at Oregon State University. And he is now a graduate student at UC Berkeley working with Rebecca Abergel. Uh, Jessica Brown was also um, with May Nyman at Oregon State University and came here to the University of Notre Dame. Uh, she's not working with me, but she's working uh, with Jeremy Fine on actinide biogeochemistry. And then Matthew Riss was an undergraduate student who worked in my lab here at Notre Dame, and I sent him back to my alma, alma mater at, at Clemson University to work with Brian Powell. Um, in addition to that, um, we are under contract with De Gruyter to deliver an actinide chemistry book, textbook to them uh, next year. Uh, so keep me in your prayers as I'm working on that uh, over the summer and uh, throughout the next academic year um, and look for it in the future as a way to, to share uh, what we all know. Our students have been extremely successful at uh, gaining external fellowship, fellowships um, from a wide variety of sources, most of them connected to the Department of Energy in some way, either through the Office of Science, the Office of Nuclear Energy, or the NNSA. Uh, but also um, in gaining fellowships uh, aimed at enhancing diversity in STEM and also from the National Science Foundation uh, through their GRFP program. Um, sort of a highlight of ACE is that uh, we really encourage and almost require every student who's funded by ACE uh, to spend at least three months at a national laboratory. Uh, we do have one student who is permanently stationed at PNNL, um, and so instead she did a three-month internship at uh, Oregon State to get some um, experience in um, in May Nyman's lab in an academic institution. Um, and here is the list of students so far who've been able to complete their national laboratory internships. So we had three students in year one. Uh, that all went to NNSA labs. In year two, Anna Ortega went to PNNL. In year three, Stephanie Mackley went to Livermore. And uh, this past year, we had three students who were able to uh, return to uh, the NNSA labs. You might notice this sort of weird trend. Uh, obviously, what happened in the middle was COVID. Uh, so that obviously impacted our ability to send every student to a national lab um, internship, though some were able to participate virtually and others chose to um, postpone their, their internship for a year or two uh, until they can return to in-person um, activities. So um, here in year four, uh, Sylvia Hanna just returned from, it was either three or six months at, at Sandia National Lab, and Julia is at LANOF also for an extended stay. So this has been um, a really good way to recruit students to our program of um, knowing that they'll have this opportunity to sort of get their foot in the door at the National Lab where many of them um, hope to go after they finish their PhDs. Uh, speaking of final placements, um, we've had uh, at least five ACE uh, students go on uh, to work at National Labs. Um, Haley Lobach was our first graduate um, or one of our first graduates. And she actually participated in the NNSA NGFP fellowship program. So um, she finished her degree and then did a fellowship program um, at NA 194.2, which is tritium uh, management. And then she actually became the federal program manager for, for that program. Um, Sarah Hickam, Mina said, uh, and are at um, um, NNSA National Labs as postdocs. I think Sarah's in the process of being converted to a full-time staff scientist. Um, Anna Ortega is the Pauling Fellow at PNNL, and Deb Malia just started uh, his postdoc um, as a computational uh, colleague at PNNL. The postdocs that were in ACE have also gone on to other postdocs uh, within the national lab system. Uh, Sewa Chong uh, went to PNNL, Melissa is at LANL, and Danielle is at Argonne National Laboratory. So again, returning to our mission and our research themes, we talked sort of about the people um, that are at the heart of ACE. Um, and now I wanna talk about uh, a few of our research highlights. 
Um, one thing that I wanna mention is that we work really hard to have um, this uh, integration of the experimental and computational approaches. So it's not just those of us who are experimentalists reaching out to the computational colleagues and saying, hey, we can't figure this out. So you have some, uh, can you provide some computational support to help us figure things out? I mean, that is uh, a good portion of it, but often uh, they're doing calculations that help inform uh, the um, syntheses, for example, that we're doing in the lab. Um, and this allows us to help cross train our students, not only in their main technical discipline, uh, but across some technical, technical disciplines. And I'll try to highlight that as I go forward. Uh, so one thing that uh, most people um, in the Action Night Center work with is metal oxide clusters. Um, so these are structures that have been studied for several decades because they are good models for understanding size property relationships. Um, and they might serve as well characterized analogs for metal oxide surfaces. Um, they have applications in the field of catalysis, energy storage, separations, material science, um, material synthesis, medicine, et cetera, electronic devices. However, in order to persist in solution, um, the surface must be stabilized uh, so that it doesn't continue to grow and then precipitate from solution. So this stabilization can take uh, several different forms. Um, the polyoxymetallates that are shown at the bottom of this screen here have um, double bonded oxygens, which we call eel oxygens, um, that are used to stabilize the surface. Um, but we could also have inorganic species such as the halogens or nitrate, or even organic ligands uh, that serve to, to stabilize the surface of these, um, these nanoclusters. So as a result, um, the behavior of these nanoclusters in solution is usually very different um, than solutions containing dissolved metal species um, or dissolved metal cations as the simple species. So this is really great because the clusters can provide new opportunities for the tailored design of materials, um, but it's not so great because they can also um, adversely impact process and environmental chemistry um, that is often targeted at these uh, more simple dissolved species. Uh, so some of the prior work in the actinide center of excellence was looking at metal oxide clusters um, that had actinides in the plus six oxidation state. Um, and so the urinal peroxide nanoclusters shown on here, the screen are sort of the poster child here. So what you're seeing is a graph of the synthesis pH that the clusters are synthesized under as a function of the number of urinal polyhedra. So if you're not familiar at looking at structures in this way, each of those uh, yellow polyhedra there's a uranium metal center um, at the middle of the polyhedra and all of the vertices represent, um, in this case, oxygen atoms that are bonded. Uh, so these are an example of clusters where we also have eel oxygens that are terminating um, the, the surface of the nanoclusters. Um, and then we have linkages um, in the equatorial plane, either as peroxide or hydroxide to form these hollow spherical structures. Um, you'll see there's also a diversity in the structures themselves. Um, the, the data, points that are yellow represent um, urinal peroxide nanoclusters that only have urinal peroxide polyhedra, um, whereas those in the dark blue have also uh, incorporated other species such as um, pyrophosphate ligands or the black uh, data points, which represent the inclusion of oxalate um, to basically provide some functionality to these, to these nanoclusters. More recently, though, we've been um, shifting to the lower valence states, so focusing on actinides in the plus four oxidation state and the metal oxide clusters that conform for them. Um, so at the top of the screen is um, the well-characterized hexanuclear species. So that means there's six um, actinide metal centers that are bridged by oxygen atoms, in this case, are often capped with organic ligands. And this hexamer has been identified for a number of the actinide elements um, from thorium, uranium, neptunium, and plutonium, at the very least. Um, and then at the bottom of the screen, you can see the additional um, hierarchy that we've identified for plutonium, uh, where we have a plutonium-16, a plutonium-22, and a plutonium-38 um, metal oxide cluster. And I'll note that the, thir the 38 um, cluster has also been identified for uranium and neptunium. Uh, but the difference there is that the uranium and neptunium species required organic ligands as capping agents, whereas uh, the plutonium uh, just requires these chloride ions as capping. Uh, so one way that we've been looking at these uh, tetravalent um, metal clusters and other similar structures is through the assembly of this M70 toroid. Um, so where M is the metal 
zirconium, cerium, or uranium. Um, and this was a great demonstration of not only being able to synthesize the parent compound, which is M70, which is really great, uh, but we are also interested in like the mechanisms of formation. So um, how does this form and precipitate from solution? What are the building blocks? Um, so Ian Collard out of um, Oregon State was able to use both a single crystal X-ray diffraction and small angle X-ray scattering to understand what the formation pathway was. Um, so the toroid itself, um, we have this M70 ring, which is the, the dark red polyhedra, um, in this case for cerium. And then there um, are decorations on the outside and the inside of the toroid with um, just the monomer, the cerium monomer that's bridged by sulfates. Um, we can see using SACs that, they, that these monomers can bridge to form a dimer and then grow to form larger species. Um, so in the crystal form, uh, the M70 toroid also has uh, this pentamer, or um, so five metal centers that are in, in the middle of the toroid. And then um, larger parts of the ring include C13 and uh, cerium 62. Um, the cerium 62, we were able to crystallize separately. And it's really cool because they form these interlocking rings um, and then can uh, grow into extended structures through the addition of uh, additional counter cations. So what we really wanted to be able to do was to try to expand this uh, further into the actinide series. And while I can say we have tried a lot with plutonium, we have not yet been successful. Um, the plutonium sulfate uh, sheet seems to be the most thermodynamic phase here. Uh, so we get, get to keep getting that instead of uh, this toroid, but it's something that we continue to work at uh, to really understand how we can master these actinide elements at the molecular scale. Uh, another area of research that almost everybody within the center um, has been working on is actinide metal organic frameworks or MOFs. Um, for those of you who don't know what a MOF is, it's a 3D uh, framework that's built by um, metal ions or clusters as the nodes and organic linkers or struts that are connecting those nodes together. Um, and so this has a long history within uh, the actinide center of excellence um, across multiple research group. Uh, so most recently, Sylvia Hanna was able to investigate uh, a uranium moth, as shown in the upper left-hand quadrant of this uh, slide here. So this is, like I said, is a uranium-based moth. And normally, uh, the structure on the left is what is um, uh, e favored at equilibrium, this highly interpenetrated uh, sort of series of, of MOFs, and that's because that minimizes the void space, and that's normally what is thought as being the most thermodynamically favorable. But what she found was that if she left that interpenetrated MOF uh, soaking in the mother liquor for a number of months, it slowly de-interpenetrated and became a single, um, a single framework without any interconnections um, into it. Uh, so something that was very interesting and like I said, uh, really goes against therm thermodynamics and what we would expect at equilibrium. And so in collaboration with some of our computational colleagues, we, she was able to figure out that the reason that this happens with this particular MOF is because of charge point to point repulsions. Um, and so the MOF, when it is not penetra uh, interpenetrated, um, is really noteworthy because it's like 98% void space. Um, so this means it might be a really good candidate um, for um, carbon capture or water cleanup or, or things of that nature. So it's an exciting avenue to pursue in the future. Uh, moving to the right, uh, the upper right quadrant um, of, of this slide, uh, Julia Knapp was able to uh, synthesize a, a, a well-known zirconium MOF, uh, which is the green structure uh, that's uh, NU1000. Um, and then she was able to attach uranium to one of the nodes um, and then use the uranium uh, node uh, to perform some photocatalysis uh, work uh, using an alcohol group. And then uh, swinging a gown clockwise to the lower right-hand quadrant, uh, a couple of years ago, we published the first plutonium metal organic framework, um, which was really um, an important step forward for us. It really requires a very controlled um, addition of water to the system because you need water in order for the assembly to occur. But if you have too much water, then you get uncontrolled uh, polymerization of the hexameric nodes. Um, and instead you get the plutonium polymer or the plutonium colloid instead of any important structure. Um, so that was something uh, we were really proud of and continues to be an avenue of research in my group. And then finally over on the left, lower left-hand quadrant um, of the slide, 
uh, represents our first steps at studying the radiation stability of these MOFs. Um, so in this paper, uh, Sylvia compared the radiation stability of NU1000 and UIO66. So again, these are both zirconium-based MOFs, uh, but they have different um, linkers and different topologies and things like that. Um, so she studied them both um, at a low gamma ray dose and a high gamma ray dose. So I think the low was like uh, one gray, uh, one gray dose and the high was, um, I wanna say 14 uh, grays or something like that. Uh, but anyway, what she found is that the NU1000 um, was really resilient and did, there was no noticeable breakdown of uh, the metal organic framework regardless of the dose that it received. Whereas the UIO66 under the low dose rate um, had some significant uh, decomposition. Uh, so this leads us to believe that the more chronic lower dose rates uh, might be more destructive to these, uh, to these compounds. <clears throat> Following up on that, um, we've done a lot of uh, radiation research onto actinide materials um, within the actinide center of excellence. So here at Notre Dame, uh, we're able to study both uh, the effects of a gamma source using a cobalt-60 irradiator and also um, using uh, facilities in, in the, the nuclear physics department to uh, expose materials to 5 MeV helium ions, which simulates alpha particle damage. And so an example, one of the first studies uh, that Jay Laverne's group did, um, this is Melissa Fairley's work, uh, was looking at the helium ion irradiation of stud type. Um, and so uh, the, the image on the left-hand side uh, shows the, you can see exactly where the beam was, you can see the damage to the material. Um, but then upon um, addition of water, uh, we see a color change in the area that was irradiated. We see the formation of bubbles. Um, and then we're able to determine that an, another amorphous uh, peroxide, urinal peroxide um, compound formed. So we've extended this to um, the zirconium, uh, to a zirconium MOF uh, to try to look more about the paper I talk, talked about earlier and this, the, really, the radiation stability of the zirconium MOF. So in this case, instead of changing the MOFs and therefore a lot of different parameters at once, uh, we sticked with one MOF and then changed um, what the linker is. Uh, so we looked at uh, the normal BDC linker, and then we can functionalize it in two different ways, one by adding an OH group and once by adding an NH2 group, and then also looked at a, a linker that was aliphatic in nature as opposed to aromatic in nature. Um, so therefore, we're looking at basically uh, increasing the electron donating group on that, uh, the, the linker. Um, and so at the bottom of the screen, you can see the, the powder X-ray diffraction results. And I know you can't see all of it, and that's not really the point. <laughs> the point is that uh, we, we studied these different zirconium MOFs with the different linkers as a function of dose, all the way from no dose up to 95, or in the case of the um, aliphatic material, up to 104 mega gray. Um, and so really what you need to be paying attention to is whether the line looks pretty flat and there are nice distinct peaks, which tells us it's a crystalline material versus whether the data is very noisy and has these very large humps in the data, because that is indicative of an, an amorphous material um, and therefore degradation of, of the moth itself. So we see that the sort of original uh, zirconium UIO66 with the BDC linker all the way over on the left-hand side was the most resistant or the most stable um, in these radiation fields um, and, and sort of lasted up until uh, that 95 mega gray. And then as we go across um, to the right-hand side of the screen, you can see the, the linker with the aliphatic nature um, barely makes it past uh, 6.2 mega gray before we see a significant uh, component of that amorphous material. Um, further analysis of, of these irradiated materials by IR, IR and Raman spectroscopy allowed us to understand where is the moth actually breaking? Um, is it breaking at the node itself? Is it the linker that's decom decomposing or what? Um, and so the areas that are highlighted in blue, what they really tell us is that the bond cleavage is at the um, the bond between the linker and the node. And so that is where um, the, the MOF is most susceptible to damage. Uh, so this allows us to um, understand whether we can specifically tailor or um, design and synthesize new MOFs that won't have this, um, this drawback or um, susceptibility to in the radiation fields 
Um, and also an understanding whether this is specific just to the, the zirconium UIO66 moth or to moths in general. Along those lines, I can say uh, that we've completed all of the, the characterization and irradiation of an entire series of um, MUIO66. So I showed you before just zirconium where we were changing what the linker is. So in this case, what we're doing is we're keeping them off the same and we're changing what the metal center is because we're able to synthesize uh, this moth um, with most tetravalent metals. So we're able to look at zirconium, hafnium, cerium, thorium, and plutonium, and therefore get an understanding of D block versus F block and 4, block, 4F versus 5F block. Um, so right now, what we can say is that the radiation stability follows the trend. The zirconium and hafnium moth are roughly of the same stability and are slightly more stable than thorium and plutonium, which are more stable in cerium. Um, right now, we're completely at a loss as to how to explain this. It doesn't follow um, any trend that we would have expected. So it's something that um, we're working uh, with the computational colleagues to, to try to understand. Um, and the final piece of research that I really wanted to talk about today is coming out of uh, the Washington State University, uh, where they're looking at incorporating actinide dioxide nanoparticles in the pores of a metal organic framework. Um, and so the reason that they're using actinide nanoparticles is because they're able to control the surface binding. You can synthesize them at a wide variety of sizes, which means that we can make them very small um, and therefore very sensitive to the different pores of a moth. Um, and we're, we're able to have milligram scale syntheses of these types of material, which means that hopefully we'll be able to move past uh, uranium dioxide and into the transuranic sometime soon. Um, so this has been demonstrated before uh, where your uranium dioxide nanoparticles were um, grown inside the pores of a co covalent organic framework, which is slightly different than a moth. Um, and the general approach that they're taking is they have a pristine moth and then they're doing infiltration of that moth and uh, with a vapor deposition um, or gaseous type of loading so that we have this precursor that is then into the pores of the moth and then completing a reduction or decomposition step, which usually consists of heating the material um, for a given amount of time that will convert the precursor into the nanoparticles. And I know this is uh, something that Leanne and her students are working on um, a lot right now and recently had uh, Beam Tyna APS to, to study their products. So again, I know I've harped on this a, a lot, a lot, but uh, I want to remind you that the mission of ACE is to conduct research in actinide chemistry um, with workforce development being our major goal. Um, and while we do have distinct research thrusts, we also have these cross-cutting things, themes of metal oxide nanoparticles, computation experiments, and um, calorimetry, which is not something I talked about today. Um, with that, again, um, I'm grateful for the funding of ACE through the national, uh, through NNSA, um, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Amy, for a beautiful talk. Questions, comments for Amy, just uh, raise your hand, uh, unmute yourself, or uh, use the chat. Maybe I'll start with maybe a general question about structures. I mean, these are beautiful, beautiful structures. And you sort of, I guess my question is how well you know them under different conditions when you grow a single crystal and you do a single crystal refinement with x-rays uh, with versus being in solution. You mentioned the, uh, the, the uh, de-interpenetration of one of these uranium moths and how well do you know that and then what's the, you know, what conditions are you determining the structure? Could you comment on any of that? Yeah, so, I mean, most of the general syntheses of the material that we're doing, uh, I'll say nominally are under whatever our ambient laboratory conditions are. So we're not necessarily controlling an inert atmosphere um, or a specific temperature or pressure or anything like that. Um, but then when we go to run, say, single crystal analysis, uh, that analysis, the, the temperature of it can, can vary depending upon what the material is um, and really the research group that, that's running the running the structure. So uh, we have capabilities to run it to, to run it under a cryostat. So sometimes we're collecting it at a lower temperature if we're worried about it decomposing while we're trying to collect the structure and other times it's closer to room temperature. And it obviously uh, depends upon what the actinide element is um, 
for example, in my own research group, we try really hard not to uh, cover our material with ice if it's plutonium, <laughs> whereas that's not as much of a, a concern if it's uranium. And then, I mean, so that's the analysis itself. Um, outside of that, uh, we are obviously looking at the radiation stability of the materials. And I think I was talking to you before uh, most people jumped on, but we are starting to do some work at HPCAT at APS to try to understand um, the response to pressure. Um, and some of that is trying to understand the response to pressure and some of it is still fundamental science and trying to understand electronic structure and things like that um, with the active mm -hmm. elements. Okay, great, thanks. So Michael has a question. Do you wanna speak up and uh, unmute yourself or should I read it? Oh, <laughs> He's, it's very loud where he is. Uh, Michael Demkowitz asks, I wonder how your MOFs can resist displacement damage due to high energy particles is displacement damage simply a minor contributor to the radiation damage for the type energy of the particles you are using, or do the MOFs somehow reconstitute themselves as they are being damaged? Oh, that's an interesting question. So uh, I think what you're asking is whether basically is there a self-healing effect as they're being irradiated um, versus yeah, versus the displacement damage. That, that's a good question. I don't think I know the answer, answer to it. Um, I think some of our spectroscopic techniques would lean towards um, that they are, they're not self-healing, right? Because um, I know, well, we haven't done it with plutonium, but for example, if we were to do it with plutonium, um, there have been some studies showing that even analysis using ramen can lead to self-healing and you would get back to, to the parent compound. But I don't know that we've looked at that, that specifically mm -hmm. with, with these materials so far. Okay, thanks. Okay, more questions. Maybe another one connected to structure. Um, I mean, you use the word amorphization. Uh, you didn't say disordering, and that can mean different things in different communities. So, um, you know, if, to what extent? You know, is there long range order, um, medium range order, short range order in these materials that are undergoing some kind of disordering transition? I guess it depends on on the system. Uh, obviously, you talked about the breakdown of the linkers and maybe the, the uh, conservation of the order in the in the nodes. You want to comment on that? Yeah. So you're asking why are we classifying sort of these PXRD spectra as amorphous material versus some other classification? That that. Oh, you muted yourself in the middle of your answer. Let's. <laughs> There's a siren where I am, <laughs> so I'll, I'll mute myself. Um, so yeah, I can I can take a stab at answering a question. So yeah, within the crystallographic community, this sort of transition that we're seeing, where we go from these really nice, well-resolved, very what I would describe as very sharp peaks in the PXRD spectrum, to something that has these very broad humps and is very noisy in nature, as a change from something that is crystalline to amorphous. Whether that actually correlates to destruction of the material, I think is a different question. And the PXRD data does not answer that question. However, that's where the IR and the Raman spectroscopy come in. And through the bands in the IR spectra at the top and the, the Raman spectra on the bottom, what the changes that we're seeing as a function of dose tell us is that we are getting some decomposition of the material and that the decomposition is coming from a break in uh, at this point in the structure where the linker is connecting to the node. Right, right, okay. I mean, that's very common in these kinds of studies where you've got to use sort of vibrational spectroscopy as well as diffraction to really get a handle on what kind of order is being preserved and what kind of disordering is taking place. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, more comments or questions? Stefano, go ahead. 
Hey, Amy, thank you very much for the presentation. And maybe I missed the point, but uh, I would like to ask you for more clarification on the role of the solvent in the porosity. If you are trying to exploit it, if you ever try to exchange of the solvent, if the stability changed with the activation of the mouth and uh, all these parts. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, so we definitely do track, um, I mean, so we, <laughs> We synthesize the MOFs and then do our characterization. And then there is an activation step, particularly before uh, we do any sort of um, uh, surface area or porosity measurements. Um, and then we also redo the characterization after that activation step to make sure that that is not damaging the material. So I can say with confidence that the activation step um, isn't affecting them. What was, can you remind me what the other part of your question was? I'm sorry. And did it, uh, if uh, this characterization was done after the activation of the mouth or if uh, um, you kept the solvent instead of the porosity. So if there was uh, any kind of uh, contribution of interaction between the solvent and the mouth and if it, it will, could affect the stability of the, of the framework. Yeah, so my understanding is that the, these radiation damage studies were done on activated materials. And yes, we repeated the characterization before and after activation to make sure that there was no damage to the moth in that sense because, because of the, lo the loss of solvent. Yeah, sometimes can be traumatic for the moth. Right. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, any more questions, comments? All right, if not, thank you very much for an excellent talk. And I thank everyone for joining us. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you again, Russ, uh, for inviting me. I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you, bye-bye.